When I got a Neiman Fellowship um, in 2012, a friend of mine, Jeff Fleischman, who was a 2002 Neiman Fellow, gave me a piece of advice. It was simple, but it was important. He said, don't pick your classes based on the subject matter. Pick them based on the professor. And one part of that that's great is that it leads you down paths um, that you didn't anticipate and plan. But also, every Neiman Fellow in this room can summon many moments, I think, when they were inspired by what they were learning from great professors in Harvard classrooms and where they sat on the edge of their seat in awe of what they were absorbing, not just in that moment, but also the ways in which it could carry forward in their work lives beyond the Neiman year. For some of us, it was sitting in Helen Vendler's class on American poetry and listening to her read Emily Dickinson's words aloud. And while you didn't walk away from your Neiman year thinking I'm gonna be the next Emily Dickinson, you people did walk away with a conviction that they were gonna bring more lyricism and poetry into their own prose. For others, they had the pleasure of exchanging ideas with Arthur Schlesinger Sr. and John Kenneth Galbraith, both of whom were dear friends to the Neiman Fellowship. Or they sat in on a law class with Tony Lewis and came away with a commitment to report more on First Amendment issues. And then there are many, probably in this room, who signed up for a class over at the Kennedy School with a psychiatrist named Ron Heifetz. And it was about leadership ostensibly and social dynamics and the politics of change. And halfway through the class, the only thing that they were sure of is that they had joined an est cult. <laughs> but by the end of the year and two and three and five years later, they realized that what they had learned, in part because they had to work so damn hard and participate so much, it had really stuck to their ribs. And they became better leaders because of it, and they saw leadership and social dynamics in ways that they hadn't before, not just in their newsroom, but in their stories and in how to frame their stories. Um, or maybe, lucky you, you have had classes with one of the seven speakers today. Six of them Harvard professors, one an MIT professor, and all of them good friends to Neiman Fellows. Let's face it, if Agnes Wall Neiman had placed her money at any place other than Harvard University, it wouldn't quite be the same. Harvard draws some of the most innovative, greatest thinkers from around the world to its campuses, to its campus, and as we learn, some of the most generous people. They open their doors to us when really their classroom is at capacity. They come over to Lippmann at the end of a long day to give a seminar to us, they meet us for coffee or beer and Chinese food. They talk about their ideas. They listen to our ideas. And in some cases, we end up collaborating. They give us something we cannot get in our newsrooms. And we take part of them back to our newsrooms with us. How many of us wish that Anne Marie had an announcement today that some wealthy Neiman alum has decided to create a postgraduate <laughs> Neiman Fellowship? <laughs> We don't, we don't need to be greedy. We'll take two or three months, um, not a whole year. And anybody who wants to step forward and talk to her about that is willing, able to do that. I, I don't know of any such plan, but I do know that Anne Marie and the amazing Neiman staff have put together the next best thing, which is a super mini Neiman Fellowship this morning. For 90 minutes, these thinkers are here to stimulate our brains, give us new ideas, and to remind us of what was best about our Neiman year and, and the ways that it can ripple outward into our work. So for the next hour and a half, sit back or sit on the edge of your seat in awe and be inspired by them. Thank you. And now I'm going to um, call up my Neiman fellows to introduce each of the speakers. Thank you. Jill Lepore is a David Woods Kempner 41 professor of American history at Harvard, who is also a staff writer at The New Yorker. Beyond her analytical brilliance, perhaps her greatest strength 
is her ability to speak to a general audience. She's one of those rare academics who can make people who are not historians think that the past really, truly matters. Her writing is powerful, infused with a fascination for the lives people led and the greater meaning behind their accomplishments, or in some cases, their lack of accomplishments. A prolific writer, her new book, Book of Ages, was long listed for the National Book Award. It tells the story of Jane Franklin, Ben Franklin's sister, Jenny and Benny, Jenny and Benny as they were known as children, scampering through their impoverished home in colonial Boston. <laughs> Professor Lepore resurrects a picture of Jane out of wisps and whispers, a life that otherwise would have fallen between the cracks of history, as it did for three centuries. But, J but Jill brings us this shadow sister who did not sign the Declaration of Independence or, or discover electricity, but instead toiled in poverty as a laundress and a mother to 12 children. But in between, she kept a lifelong correspondence with her brother, a lifeline to another world. He loved no one longer, she loved no one better, she writes in a New Yorker piece that ingeniously interweaves the lives of Jane Franklin together with her own mother's life and her own. Her mother, the thwarted artist, would nudge her bashful bookish daughter, Jill, to get out there and explore the world. We are so grateful that her mother knew how to push and that she knew how to listen to become one of the most important public intellectuals and important storytellers of our day. Thank you so much, and I think we should all celebrate pushy mothers. <laughs> There's never enough occasions to do that. Um, I am so happy to be here and thrilled at the nature of this event. I often, when I've come over to speak to Neiman Fellows, feel that I'm very much on the wrong side of the podium. So I would just like to make a suggestion, although I think the postgraduate year is a brilliant one as well. I think for the next 75 years, the Harvard faculty ought to really learn from the Neiman Fellows a bit more. Uh, I would really love to see that. I would love to have more opportunities for those of us on the faculty to hear more about what you all do and the world that you all live in. Um, it's just a real treat for those of us who are so cloistered here to have you here on campus. And I, and I can't really sort of speak enough to what it means in a classroom to the undergraduates and the graduate students here at Harvard to meet with journalists from all over the world and to get your perspective. The ways in which it enriches everything that we do here at Harvard, I think, can't really be celebrated enough. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about something I'm sure none of you have thought about at all recently. Like, has anybody heard of Edward Snowden? Or... <clears throat> I feel like I don't really need to kind of situate the present day crisis over privacy and security and secrecy in the world. What I really wanted to do, though, is to give you a little bit of a vantage on something I've been thinking a lot about lately, which is the history of this dilemma. Um, we have lately, I think, a, a notion that privacy uh, is, has been shifted due to profound historical change it, this idea that a kind of timeless human right, our very privacy, is threatened or maybe even dead here, in, mourned in a fun funeral for privacy. Privacy, of course, isn't dead, but nor is it timeless, and that's something that we often forget. I want to give you a brief account of its history, but I think it's important to remember when thinking about the history of privacy that it can't be understood without thinking about the history of publicity. That's something that I think we often miss. So I want to show you a very little clip that leaves my jaw dropped. The miraculous is everywhere, in our homes, our minds. We can share every second in data dressed as pixels. A billion roaming photojournalists uploading the human experience, and it is spectacular. So why would you cap that? My iPhone 5 can see every point of view, every panorama, the entire gallery of humanity. I need to upload all of me. I need, no, I have the right to be unlimited. Only Sprint offers truly unlimited data for iPhone 5. What the hell is that? <laughs> I have the right to be unlimited? What? Is nobody noticing this claim that we have a right to publicity, that it is an almost an elemental human right? I think we can't, so my point here is we can't understand the dilemma about privacy absent a consideration of the history of this bizarre assertion of the right to publicity. Exploring the history of privacy requires I think investigating what is essentially a paradox of a culture obsessed at once with being hidden and with being seen. 
Historically, understanding this paradox requires thinking about three different ideas, and that's really what I want to do today. As I see it, there are a transformation in which these three ideas have moved in a particular direction. My argument here is that much that was once mysterious became secret, and then it became private. That we need to understand, to understand the paradox between publicity and privacy, we need to understand the relationship among mystery, secrecy, and privacy, and their different claims historically. Mystery is what we can, uh, can't know but are asked to believe. Secrecy is what is known but not to everyone. Privacy is what allows us to keep what we know to ourselves. So think about these three ideas. We could define them differently, but these are rough and ready definitions. Mystery is the oldest of these ideas. It's an antique idea, and for most of its history, mystery has been a religious idea. Immortality, for instance, is a mystery. Secrecy is what happens when mystery yields to science. So for instance, scientists want to uncover the secret of aging. And one way of understanding privacy, as it's most commonly used today, is that it's mystery made secular and secrecy made into a matter of law. My end of life decisions, for instance, I think are private. So I think you can see here a transformation, a change over time historically, again, in which much that was once mysterious became secret, and then it became private which is why we are so alarmed about it. A good deal of this shift, for instance, concerns our bodies. I just want to give you some examples of this transformation. Think about conception, what happens inside a woman's body, the most hidden of places. Anciently invoked as one of God's mysteries, conception was then studied by anatomists as the secret of generation, and most recently, the act of conception and the prevention of that act have been defended against intrusion by citizens using the language of a constitutional right to privacy. Much that was once mysterious became secret, and then it became private. Uncovering this secret and then making a claim to its privacy had to do with technologies. You can make this argument about many different kinds of things. Take, for instance, the circulatory system. What was once mysterious became secret, and then it became finally private. As with conception, the idea that our blood is private, we can't, for instance, be forced to take a blood test, is contingent on first its demystification. It needs to move from the realm of the religious to the realm of the secular. And second, to the exposure of its secrets through the lens of science. For something that was once mysterious and known only to God to become a secret, it needs to be visible, be made visible by new kinds of lenses. Only then comes privacy. In other words, the case for privacy comes after and never before the act of exposure, which is why, again, we're so buggy about it. The case for privacy always follows the emergence of new technologies that make visible once what was once secret. The case for privacy always comes too late. So if you are with me so far and are willing to accept this basic premise that there's been this historical shift from mystery to secrecy to privacy, how are we to understand, what's even driving that shift? How are we to understand it? The forces that drive this kind of a shift are largely technological and are interestingly technological. We could kind of, I could use here another kind of short uh, triptych to illustrate those changes, but again, it's a very, very rough and ready kind of illustration. But the technologies that lie behind this shift have to do with technologies that rather mercilessly seek and reveal what is hidden. The printed book ushered in the end of the age of mystery. The camera exposes the secrets of the natural world. And the book that is also a camera is what we think invades our privacy, but also lies behind our bizarre assertion of a right to publicity. So just to give you a little bit more of an understanding of, of these notions and how they change, and I want to kind of get to this publicity matter. A mystery in Christian theology is what God knows and man cannot. A mystery was not like what Edgar Allan Poe writes. A mystery was immortality or conception. During the Protestant Reformation, uh, Protestants considered mysteries to be pagan, and what was mysterious moved from church to state and from priests to princes, so that by the 17th century, a mystery was what the king knew and the people could not. That was called a mystery of state. 
The United States was founded in opposition to that notion. That's why we have a written constitution, because we opposed, the founders of the United States opposed the idea of the mystery of state, the king's prerogative, the idea that the king ought to know things that the people could not. That kind of, that, you know, when we celebrate transparency in the United States and government or as necessary to a democracy, that comes because of this very important historical turning point in which mystery was abandoned and critiqued. The new nation's body of laws would not, like England's constitution, be left unwritten and invisible. They would be written down, exposed, as Patrick Henry said, to the public eye. That's why Americans celebrated, in the beginning of the 19th century, publicity, which meant something different then. Publicity used to mean simply transparency, to make something public. Publicity was a good thing. It was a good thing, for instance, to publish the proceedings of parliament. Publicity in government would lead to better government. So, as Jeremy Bentham wrote in 1843, secrecy is an instrument of conspiracy. It ought not, therefore, to be the system of a regular government. When we talk about Snowden and Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, we are actually largely deriving our entire worldview from Jeremy Bentham. Bentham argued, was the one who argued that the proceedings of parliament ought to be made public, and also that ordinary citizens ought to be allowed into parliament to watch those proceedings. This had an extraordinary influence on the United States. What Bentham was opposed to was what he called the partisans of mystery. This is their reasoning, he thought. You are incapable of judging because you are ignorant, and you shall remain ignorant that you may be incapable of judging. Bentham was a real hero in the early United States, and a lot of our efforts to make public the proceedings of government are derived from his arguments made in 1843. His arguments are why votes held in Congress are public, held up to the public eye. What's weird about the United States is that in the 19th century, Americans became obsessed also with privacy, with domesticity, with shutting the windows and the doors of their houses against the public view. Because by the 1880s, citizens began, for instance, voting even in privacy. This is a new thing in the United States in the 1880s. Even though Congress voted in public, we had the idea that citizens had a different kind of right to political privacy, that our votes should be secret. Before the 1880s, Americans voted in public in the open. Your vote was known to all in the same way that it was known to Congress. That idea that there should be something very particularly private about a citizen's life was most fully expressed in 1890, and most famously by two Boston lawyers, Samuel Warren and Louis Brandeis, who published this article in the Harvard Law Review, The Right to Privacy. They argued here that, that people had inherently, uh, and essentially constitutionally, even though of course this is nowhere mentioned in the con Constitution, a right to be let alone, a right to inviolate personality. What they meant here was that they shouldn't actually be bothered by journalists. The whole thing came about because Warren's wife and daughter had been harassed by the press. And Warren believed that although the votes of Congress should be held up to public eye, and in that sense publicity was a good thing, publicity for ordinary people was a moral wrong and a system of oppression. The right to privacy is an assertion of the importance of a veil from the public eye, and the public eye in this instance meaning the eye of the journalist. Warren and Brandeis understood very well that what they were talking about had not existed eternally. It was a consequence of modernity. It was a consequence of these very technological changes. For instance, the portable camera that made it necessary for people to assert a right to privacy and to defend it as something that was in fact part of their constitutional inheritance. Warren and Brandeis argued that the violation of this new called newfangled right to privacy peering through keyholes and peeping through curtains constitutes a kind of wound, a puncturing of the soul that might finally deprive men of their reason. The right to privacy they understood as a function of history, it had become necessary because of the shifting nature of journalistic inquiry, because of the shifting meaning of the very word publicity. I want to end with another clip that I think really well illustrates what I mean by this historical transformation that I think helps us to understand the nature of our anxiety about privacy and publicity today. H.G. Uh, Wells wrote this terrific novel in 1897 that's very much influenced by the sensibility that Warren and Brandeis um, elaborated on in their 1890 article, The Invisible Man. In, in 1933, it was made into this terrific film starring Claude Rains. I'm going to show you a very short clip. In this clip, the Invisible Man has hidden himself in an English country inn. 
He's begged the innkeeper to grant him solitude and privacy. We see, but uh, uh, the invisible man does not, that he is also fast losing his sanity. He's become violent, and the innkeeper has summoned the police. Keep back, you kids, there. Yeah, what's all this? Keep back there. Keep back, me? Do you know who you're talking to? I give you a last chance to leave me alone. Give me a last chance. You've committed assault, this what you've done, and you can come along to the station with me. Come along now, come quietly, unless you want me to put the handcuffs on. Stop where you are. You don't know what you're doing. I know what I'm doing, all right. Come on. Get all of him. Lock him up. All right, you fools. You've brought it on yourselves. Everything would have come right if you'd only left me alone. You've driven me near madness with your peering through the keyholes and gaping through the curtains. And now you'll suffer for it. You're crazy to know who I am, aren't you? All right, I'll show you. There's a souvenir for you. And one for you. I'll show you who I am and what I am. <laughs> Look, he's all eaten away. Huh? How do you I hope you can see the reading here that I'm going to give you that, that, I, that I hope should be obvious by now. In this scene, the age of mystery is over. Mortals here ascend the stairs to the heavens to see the face of God. They have exposed what was hidden to the public eye. They have peered through the peepholes, and they have propped open the door. And they have discovered much that was once mysterious and how it became secret, and now it is private. The story here, the real reason, I think, why the world is in such a panic about privacy right now is that historically, the inviolability of the self has replaced the inscrutability of God. That is to say, what was once mysterious and known only to God as a mystery has become what we believe is in our own souls and must be forever hidden. That obsession, this notion of the inviolability of ourselves, having the same kind of stake as the inscrutability of God has left us all slightly mad. To be seen, I think, here, the story of the invisible man, to be seen, to be always seen, to have a right to be unlimited is to be finally nobody. Thank you. The title of university professor was created in 1935. It is the highest distinction of a Harvard faculty member. Out of 2,100 faculty, total faculty of Harvard, there are only 24 university professors at the moment. And our next, next guest is one of them. William Julius Wilson is one of America's most accomplished analysts of race, inequality, and poverty. His father died young, leaving his mother to pull six kids out of poverty. All ended up going to college. He is largely a product of public education. After earning his PhD at Washington State University in 1966, he taught at the University of Massachusetts Amherst before joining the faculty of the University of Chicago. In 1996, after 24 years teaching there, he came to Harvard faculty. He is the sociologist whose research on poverty forced policymakers to look to the inner city. In fact, President Bill Clinton said in his book, and I quote, his book made me see race, poverty, and the problems of the inner city in a different light. He has received over 40 honorary degrees, including honorary doctorates from Princeton, Columbia, Johns Hopkins, and the University of Pennsylvania. During last year's Yale's commencement ceremony, Dr. Wilson received an honorary doctorate in social science 
for a life works devoted to studying inequality. Your scholarship, they say, has sparked major debates about how we as a nation can address some of our most vexing problems. Generations of scholars have built upon your work. One of his books provided the backdrop for a season of HBO series, The Wire. So without further delay, Dr. Wilson. Is the green light on? Uh, it will be, okay. Well, it's an honor to be able to address this august body. And I want to share with you uh, the big picture in less than 10 minutes <laughs> that I first presented in my book, When Work Disappears, The World of the New Urban Poor, published in 1996 by Alfred A. Knopf, and which continues to guide this big picture that I developed in that, in that book, continues to guide my current research. And the big picture is the impact of joblessness on poor inner city neighborhoods a lingering problem that is especially relevant today, given the state of our economy in the aftermath of the Great Recession? In When Work Disappears, I discuss the new urban poverty, which refers to poor, segregated neighborhoods in which a considerable number of individual adults are either officially unemployed or have dropped out or never been a part of the labor force and therefore are not included in the official unemployment rates. As I reported in Work Disappears, a neighborhood in which people are poor but employed is much different from a neighborhood in which people are poor and jobless. In 1950, a very high number of adults, black adults, were poor, but they were working. Urban poverty was quite extensive, but people held jobs. However, as we entered the 1990s, most adults in the ghetto neighborhoods of our larger cities were not working in a typical week. Take, for example, the city of Chicago, where I conducted a good deal of my earlier research. I reported in When Work Disappears that in 1950, a significant majority of adults held jobs in a typical week in the three neighborhoods that represent the historic core of the Black Belt, Douglas, Washington Park, and Grand Boulevard. By 1990, only four in 10 in Douglas worked in a typical week, one in three in Washington Park, and one in four in Grand Boulevard. I described in Work Disappears how the disappearance of work in these neighborhoods not only adversely affected individuals and families, but the social life of neighborhoods as well. Inner city joblessness is a severe problem that is often overlooked or obscured when the focus is mainly on poverty and its consequences. Despite the increases in the concentration of poverty since 1970, inner cities have always featured high levels of poverty. But the level of inner city joblessness today far exceeds that of earlier periods. In explaining the growth of inner city jobless poverty, one has to, first of all, take into account the ways in which racial segregation interacts with other changes in the larger society to produce the recent escalating rates of neighborhood joblessness, including 
the nationwide decline in the fortunes of low-skilled workers, and the growing suburbanization of jobs. Secondly, one has to consider the impact of changes in the class, racial, and demographic composition of inner city neighborhoods. Indeed, with a steady out migration of more advantaged families since 1970, the proportion of non-poor families and prime age working adults has decreased sharply in many inner city ghettos, especially in the Northeast and Midwest. The increase in prolonged joblessness, the declining proportion of non-poor families, and the overall depopulation have made it more difficult to sustain basic institutions and to achieve adequate levels of social organization in these neighborhoods. The declining presence of working and middle class blacks has also deprived ghetto neighborhoods of key resources, including structural resources, such as residents with income to sustain neighborhood services, and cultural resources, such as conventional role models for neighborhood children. All of these changes have had a profound effect on the social organization of these neighborhoods, resulting in a weak institutional resource base. You see, it is easier for parents to control the behavior of the children in their neighborhood when a strong institutional resource base exists. And when the links between community institutions, such as churches, schools, political organizations, businesses, and civic clubs are strong or secure, the higher the density and stability of formal organizations, the less illicit activities, such as drug trafficking, crime, prostitution, and the formation of gangs can take place in the neighborhood. Take drug trafficking. My research and the research of others have revealed an association between declining legitimate employment opportunities among inner city residents and increased incentives to sell drugs. In neighborhoods plagued by high levels of joblessness, insufficient economic opportunities, and high residential mobility are unable to control the violent drug market and the violent crimes, the volatile drug market and the violent crimes related to it. As a result, the behavior and norms in the drug market are more likely to influence the actions of others in the neighborhood even those who are not directly involved in drug activity. Drug dealers escalate the use and spread of guns in the neighborhood, which in turn raises the likelihood that others, particularly youngsters, will come to view the possession of weapons as necessary or desirable for self-protection, settling disputes, gaining respect from, from peers and other individuals. I'm glad that you mentioned that my book influenced the writing of The Wire. <laughs> I take great pride in that, so I just want to. <laughs> Moreover, the drug industry actively recruits teenagers in the neighborhood, not only because they are willing to accept lower wages, but also because they tend to be more courageous and will take risks that more mature adults would avoid. Inner city black youth, with limited prospects for stable and attractive employment are easily lured into drug trafficking and therefore invariably find themselves involved in a violent behavior that accompanies it. To repeat, a weak institutional resource base is what distinguishes high jobless inner city neighborhoods from stable middle class and working class areas. As one resident of a high jobless neighborhood on the south side of Chicago put it, quote, our children, you know, seems to be more at risk than any other children there is because there's no library for them to go to. There's not a center they can go to. There's no field house they can go into. There's nothing, there's nothing at all. Parents in high jobless neighborhoods have a much more difficult task of controlling the behavior of their adolescents, of preventing them from getting involved in activities detrimental to pro-social development 
And given the lack of organizational capacity and a weak institutional resource base in these neighborhoods, some parents choose to protect their children by isolating them from activities in the neighborhood, including the, avoid the avoidance of contact and interaction with neighborhood families. And wherever possible, and often with great problems, great difficulty, when one considers the problems of transportation and limited financial resources, they attempt to establish contacts and cultivate relations with individuals, families, and institutions outside the neighborhood, such as church groups, schools, and community recreation programs. It is just as indefensible to treat inner city residents as superheroes who overcome chronic racial and economic subordination as it is to view them as helpless victims. We should, however, appreciate the restricted range of choices that are available to inner city families and residents in jobless neighborhoods because they live under constraints and face challenges that most people in the larger society do not experience or can't, or can't even imagine. And I wish there was a greater appreciation for their incredible ordeals especially among national policymakers. Thank you. Katie Hindi will tell you more than you thought you ever wanted to know about breast milk. If you think you're not particularly interested in breast milk, you will be about 10 minutes from now. I have 90 seconds to tell you everything I think you need to know about Katie Hindi. Katie is 33, her favorite color is green. She loves primates, particularly baboons. And her Twitter handle is mammals suck. <laughs> Milk, that is. If Katie could be reborn as any mammal in the whole world, she told me it would be a high-ranking female hyena. <laughs> because they are so joyful and social. And because they have this very special kind of elongated clitoris that makes them one of the very few female mammals in the world that are rape-proof. <laughs> Katie has three tattoos, a beetle, a swallow, and two arrows. Did you know that if you lined up all the animal species in the entire world, every fourth one would be a beetle? And did you know that the swallow of Capistano in California has a migration radius of 5,000 miles? It's amazing what you learn when you ask Katie about her tattoos. She, too, spent a lot of time in California, and her migration radius is pretty large. She just came back from Namibia, where she was interviewing Himba women about their breasts, as you do. <laughs> She's super passionate about her research. If you really want to get her excited, ask her about how kangaroos breastfeed. It's pretty cool. Katie finished high school at 15 and college at 19. She then took three years off because she decided she didn't want to go to graduate school before she could go to a happy hour. <laughs> Her dad was a basker. He wrote political lyrics for folk songs. And when Katie went up to him and said she wanted to go into science, he's, he asked her, have you thought about creative writing? <laughs> so, Katie Hindi is a child of hippies, a lover of animals, a fan of tattoos, an admirer of hyenas. And there's one other thing. She's also assistant professor of evolutionary biology at Harvard University. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for that very um, uh, colorful introduction. <laughs> and uh, thank you to um, Anne Marie and everybody at the Neiman Foundation for inviting me to come and speak with you this morning. Um, the afternoon I spent at the Neiman Foundation last year was one of my favorite afternoons um, since I've come to Harvard because it was just a phenomenal discussion and, and very inspiring to me as to why I do what I do. So um, the punchline is, is, is obviously milk. This is why mammals suck. And oftentimes, when I tell people what I study, um, they find it not terribly interesting, right? Because they're like, why would you study milk? Right? It's ubiquitous within our environment. You can go to the store. There's entire aisles full of dairy products. And seemingly, we've been able to recreate the magic of mother's milk through infant formulas. And this idea that because milk products 
come homogenized, that they are homogenous, is a, is a very problematic thing because in actuality, mother's milk across mammals has been evolving for 300 million years. It is what has allowed mammals to take over every continent on this planet because we can now raise our young in environments in which those young would otherwise die, where there's no food for them, where they couldn't maintain their body temperature. They're able to do this through mother's milk and milk feeding. 300 million years. This makes milk older than dinosaurs, something that is less understood. And why milk has evolved and how it's been shaped by natural selection is one of the great mysteries to evolutionary biology in many ways, mostly because mammary tissue does not fossilize terribly well. But today, we still do not know everything that is in mother's milk, how it is that it gets into the milk, and what it does when it's ingested by the infant. So this is, this is the essential tension that I face as a lactation biologist. You can buy milk at the store, it's everywhere you look, and yet it remains one of the most mysterious things in our world. So if you put into one of the main scientific literature search databases key words to find academic and intellectual articles about mother's milk, you will find that the sum total of human knowledge is actually remarkably small. And when you see this, it should make you angry. <laughs> it, should, it should make you angry. And that's because what we do know has made it clear that aspects of mother's milk can help us to solve some of the greatest medical health crises facing our planet today. So, for the first time in human history, more people's health is threatened by overeating than by undereating. For the first time. And it's been shown that there are aspects of breast milk that can help prevent the development of childhood obesity and being overweight. Five million kids per year will get diarrheal disease, and 1.5 million of them will die each year. And it's been shown that there are constituents in mother's milk that can help prevent rotaviruses and other aspects of diarrheal disease. And for our most vulnerable infants that are born, these infants that are preterm, that end up in neonatal intensive care units, it's been shown systematically that human breast milk provides them the healthiest nutrition and is most protective for their development and survival. In the last year, two new studies have shown that there are constituents in breast milk that kill the HIV virus and that breast milk is a source of stem cells that can develop into cells from all three germ layers. Previously, we've had to rely on embryonic stem cells for this kind of stem cell technology. Breast milk represents the opportunity to non-invasively and non-destructively acquire stem cells for research and perhaps someday transformative medical technology. So when you think of milk, don't think of the dairy aisle. Don't think of it as just a food. Right? It's also a medicine. And there are constituents in milk hormones that signal very important things to the developing infant that shape their development. And these are all integrated together, hundreds, maybe thousands of bioactive constituents that a mother synthesizes specifically at that time for that specific infant. It is, in many ways, natural selection and evolution's magic potion. It's not a big idea. It's random mutations that have been shaped for millions of years to provide an unbelievable medicine, food, and signal to infants. And it doesn't just help those infants to survive and grow and be healthy. It also helps those infants 
during their first behavioral experiences. And so I, I have a series of photos here because I love them because they show the, the monkeys that I predominantly study with um, humans that I, I study um, also. So you can think about mother's milk is what is underlying the behavioral activity of infants' first interactions with their mothers and others. It provides the energy that they need to begin to explore their environment. And it also provides the energy and signals that are going to be shaping the development of their social experience, which of course is a fancy scientific way to say playing, right? And this, this is what milk is. But we still don't know so much about it. So I mentioned that there's an amazing variation among mothers. Right? And this can be due to the mother's genes, the mother's own uh, life history, where she's been in her life, her, her body condition, her health, things like that. But there's now a growing body of evidence that suggests that there's a different biological recipe for milk if she's rearing a son or a daughter. So we've found, my lab and other labs, differences in fats and proteins and calcium and hormones and in the volume of milk that's produced that are specific to whether or not that mother is rearing a son or a daughter. And this is in part because the developmental trajectories and developmental priorities of male and female mammalian infants can oftentimes be different. And they need different milk in order to sustain that. This isn't just true in humans. It's actually been documented across a wide variety of mammal species. This is just one example in which milk is very unique. And yet, when you go to the store for mothers who aren't breastfeeding and you go to get formula, they don't have formulas that are tailored specifically to the developmental priorities of those particular infants. Now, that's the science. Okay? And I love science. Science is really, really important. But the translation of that science into people's real everyday lives is where science starts to matter, honestly. And mothers have gotten the message about the magic potion that is breast milk. A majority of mothers intend to breastfeed, and yet they fail to meet their breastfeeding goals. And this is something that needs to be addressed. Because when I talk all about how milk is so spectacular, and many people talk about breast is best or breastfeeding is what women should do with their bodies, then what you're finding is an infant-centric agenda. And we need a lot more advocacy for mothers. They are half of this equation. And there are a number of challenges and barriers, especially in the United States, for women to meet their breastfeeding goals. So one of them is that there's this myth that motherhood is, this, you know, it's natural. Breastfeeding is natural. It's evolved, right? That is not a synonym, synonym for it's easy, okay? Just because something has deep evolutionary roots and is natural doesn't mean that we're automatically good at it as soon as we start, right? So kind of remember, you know, like another thing that has deep evolutionary roots, like sex, right? Nobody starts out being perfect at it. Right? And that's the point with breastfeeding, is that mothers aren't getting a lot of guidance and information until after they've already had the infant. Okay? So after they've gone through the experience of childbirth, which can be very traumatic, and they've got all these hormones, and their milk's not coming in, their milk's not laying down, and their infant's not latching on, and they're having all of these challenges, and they're feeling that they're failing as a mother. Because this thing that they thought was supposed to be so effortless and natural is actually a skill that you need to develop and you need help developing it. And this is not just true for career women in the United States. Last week I was in Namibia talking with Himba women and talking to them about the challenges that they faced when they first started breastfeeding. Okay. This is on the mother side level. But there's also infrastructure that provides a lot of challenges. Breastfeeding takes time. Right? You need space and time in which to do it, and yet it's not standard in our country to have paid maternity leave to do it. Right? And there, this is changing, but there aren't a lot of spaces and break time in order to do these things. And most importantly, 
Women who don't breastfeed, because it's contraindicated for medical reasons, because of cultural history that they've experienced where it's not common in their community, because they just don't want to, they, they, they choose formula. We need to know what is in breast milk and what it does in the infant so that we can make a better formula for those mothers. Because if you love babies, you have to love mothers. And if you have a mother or love a mother or know a mother or employ a mother, it's important to think about everything that goes into her achieving these healthy goals that increase the health and development of infants and thereby improve the health of all of our society. Thank you. It's a huge honor to introduce Ethan Zuckerman. Um, I don't know Ethan personally, but I feel as if I do because his name is invoked so often in my newsroom. I produce a public radio program called The World, and we share all the same obsessions, international news, global stories, connecting people across borders and languages, and his work founding this global community of online bloggers, Global Voices, has just been a profound influence on us. And his generosity of spirit in supporting us and collaborating with us is sort of testament to who he is. Anyone who reads his blog knows that he can think and write about anything. And I, if I'm remembering correctly, his last interview on our radio show was about the diets of sumo wrestlers. <laughs> um, strip away all the, all the titles and everything. What I see is this man with a giant brain, but I think an even larger heart, who uses his intellect in pursuit of making the world a better place and making journalism a better profession. And the thing that I really value and that I think is about his work now is he teaches me why my job is so hard, that you can have all the good intentions in the world and all the most powerful technologies and it's still really, really hard to have a meaningful interaction with someone on the other side of the world. Um, there are just too many barriers, linguistic, psychological, physical, political, um, to get us out of our Twitter bubbles and out of our echo chambers. But the good news is that he has all kinds of groovy ideas about how we can rewire ourselves and our digital endeavors to make those connections flow. So I give you Ethan Zuckerman, citizen of the world. Well, uh, thank you so much. That was incredibly kind. And I have to say, this is, uh, of the four talks I've been uh, scheduled to give this week, the one that I was scared of. Uh, and I was scared of it because, um, by the nature of what I work on, I have to talk about the future of journalism to a room full of journalists, uh, including some, uh, many, who I, I, I deeply respect and, and know and follow the work of. Uh, and now I'm even more scared because I've just followed three of the best speakers that I've uh, heard in the recent past. And I should also say, it's a little tricky for me because um, in, in, in this particular group, I'm coming from the wrong side of the tracks. I teach at a small technical institution, uh, two subway stops uh, further down in a different part of town. Uh, but I teach a class over at MIT's Media Lab uh, called News and Participatory Media. Uh, and this is a class uh, that's, I've been very lucky, I've had a number of Neiman Fellows as well as some other folks who are on mid-career journalism fellowships coming over uh, and hanging out with us. And I designed this class to be a class for MIT students. It was designed for geeks to sort of expose them to the basics of journalism in the hopes that when they sort of stood up and said, let's build some tools for the newsroom, they would actually have a clue what they were actually talking about. And I've ended up instead having a class that's about half hacks and half hackers. I, I get these mid-career journalists who want to come and see what's going on with the digital revolution that's destroying their jobs or maybe changing what they do. And one way or another, it's ended up being quite a lively discussion most of the time because you have people who are here sort of thinking about what it's going to mean to be a journalist in a digital age and you have people who think that the response to every industry is to disrupt it. 
And so you end up with these two folks together really having this deep conversation about what we want journalism, what we want media, what we want news to do, and it's a good bit of fun, and I really enjoy provoking. So I try to have this class be as sort of lively as possible, and with this in mind, I came into class with an article uh, published in the spring. It was an excerpt from a book, uh, and the book is by a guy named Rolf Debelli. Rolf Debelli is a Swiss novelist who decided to write a book called The Art of Thinking Clearly, and this was basically his response to reading a bunch of neuroscience and maybe pop neuroscience, and to make the case that as human beings, we don't do a very good job of thinking about things. And so I know my limits, I know that I'm not thinking very clearly about this, but I, I'll tell you that in my limited capacities, this is not a very good book. But the <laughs> best part of this book gets published in The Guardian, and it gets published as this quite interesting article, which I actually recommend, titled, News is Bad for You. And DeBelli puts out this, this argument, and, and that's exactly what I was looking for. I was looking for the hissing. Hissing is what I'm looking for out of this talk. So I brought in this article, looking for the hissing, because DeBelli stands up and says, I haven't read news for four years. I'm a better person for it. News is a drug, it stimulates my limbic system, it basically gives me something that I can reload again and again, and I feel like I'm doing something good, but I'm not actually doing something for myself. And I brought this into my class, and I'm expecting the Irish brawl that we had in the last slide. And what we actually got was a lot of people sort of sadly nodding and going, actually, kind of a lot of this argument makes sense. And, and what's interesting about it is that DeBelli makes a whole mess of points some of them basically are beating up bad journalism, talking about journalism that doesn't give you context, doesn't give you background, doesn't give you the full story, and everybody in the class, the hacks and the hackers, can agree that's a bad thing. But he also goes forward and he basically says, look, one of the real serious problems with journalism is that much of the time it's telling us about things that we have no control over, and it's putting ourselves in a pattern of learned helplessness. And if we are simply giving people information that they have no control, no agency over, and they're encountering it again and again and again, and the only job is to read it and stay informed, are we actually helping them? Are we actually engaging with them? Now, this argument is a real problem for me, because my whole shtick the last decade has been standing up and telling Americans that they're not getting enough news about the rest of the world, that for their own cognitive diversity, their ability to take on big problems, they need to have a global view. I have a website that's focused on this for nine years with 1,400 volunteers. I just wrote a book about it. I really want people to pay attention to the Arab Spring. I want them to pay attention to the protests in Sudan. I want them to pay attention to the rise of the middle class in Africa. But when I look at this argument, I'm forced to look at this and sort of go, yeah, the vast majority of what I'm asking people to pay attention to in the hopes that they are better citizens is not something that they are able to have direct influence or direct impact on. So I've been wrestling with this since I brought this into class and was really surprised that my journalist didn't stand up and, and rally against this article. And I finally started to make some sense out of it when I spent a good chunk of the summer reading Michael Schudson's work, and particularly this book, The Good Citizen. And Schutzen is an amazing, thoughtful guy about the role of media in citizenship over time. And what Schutzen basically does in this book is he says a lot of how we think about what it means to be a good citizen is not inevitable, is not perpetual, it's actually pretty recent. That when we have the founding of the republic, when we have the constitutional moment, being a good citizen basically means affirming the leadership of societal elites. You don't have a competitive election. People show up in public and they jointly agree that this prominent citizen is going to lead us. And then we move to a party system. We're not actually arguing over issues. We're affiliating with a party based on our social structures and our employment and the people that we know and we're voting in public and they're giant parties and you vote and you hand your vote and someone hands you a glass of punch. And this model of secret voting, this model of the informed voter is actually very recent. 
It comes with a progressive error, where we start saying we want journalists to try to inform us on a whole range of issues. And as informed citizens, we're going to go off and vote, and we're going to have an impact either on electing a representative or on passing a piece of legislation through the ballot initiative system. And Schutzen basically says not only is this not inevitable, it's probably something of a farce. Because when you look at that 400-page voter guide you get to all the California ballot propositions and all the people on it, most of us are not reading it and taking notes and having debate in the public sphere about it. We are making our votes in a different way. And he goes even further and he basically says, and this isn't even our model of citizenship at the moment. The model of citizenship is playing out in the courts. It's playing out around a rights discourse. Now, I don't buy all of this, but I found it really helpful because it was helping me understand what I'm seeing in my work. I do an enormous amount of work looking at young people and digital activism and how young people think they are going to have change in society. And when I look at this, it's very rarely people saying, I want to be part of a political campaign or I need to be involved on a giant wide slate of issues. It tends to be this very sort of pointillist approach to involvement. It's trying to figure out how can I help economics with a single loan through Kiva where I'm loaning directly to a micro-entrepreneur. It's giving through something like Donors Choose, where I'm going to a specific classroom and a specific teacher. It's people running campaigns, not around a general set of social issues or for social change, but specifically for the arrest of George Zimmerman or for Joseph Coney. It's this version of citizenship. It's highly personal. It's highly decentralized. It's pointillist. It's not sweeping in scope. And it's a vision of citizenship that's very, very consistent with the moment in media, where everybody is creating their own media, even if it's just the Facebook update or the tweet telling people how dreadful this talk is at the moment. <laughs> and it's a really confusing moment. And we've seen it as a really confusing moment to try to report the news. How do we figure out what's going on in the Westgate Mall in Kenya when we're sorting between a government that's actually lying to us in their reports, eyewitness accounts that may or may not be lying or may actually be the terrorists on the ground, and politics is getting that confusing as well. How do we react to tens of millions of Americans showing up and saying, as teenage Americans, the most important issue to us is arresting a warlord whose most dangerous moments were 10 years ago in Uganda? Does that shift the agenda? Does it change how we think about youth and involvement? Or does it actually just change how we think about how the shape of civics is taking place right now? There's a whole rhetoric around the idea that youth are disengaged, that they're not involved. They're not apathetic. Actually, they're utterly desperate to have an impact. But they don't think they're going to have an impact through the institutions through which we believe they should have an impact. And this is where we need media to help. We need media to step up and say, if you want to have an impact on society, if you want to be an educated citizen, we have to help you figure out how to be involved and involved in a way where you can actually see the impact of where it's going. And there are a lot of cases where we're not afraid to do this. When there's an environmental disaster or a tragedy in the wake of Hurricane Sandy, the New York Times will stand up and say, here's where you should give money. Here are the organizations you should help. We're going to match you to things you should do. But we should be doing this all across the journalistic spectrum. We should be doing this in the way that David Bornstein is standing up and saying in solutions journalism, we're going to identify people who are solving the problems that we're paying attention to. We should be doing what the Christian Science Monitor is when they're working with Shoutabout to try to connect their Decode DC coverage to actual campaigns that they can be involved in. My company over at Global Voices, we should be trying to figure out how we don't just report on the Westgate shootings, but we help people figure out what they might be able to do in response to it. Now, what we can't keep doing is building news that is disconnected from people's ability to have an impact. We can't continue to say, we're going to put this information out here, you're going to be an informed citizen, and then something will happen, and it's all going to work out from there. It doesn't work for this generation of people. And they're not going to pay attention to it. There's too much else that they can pay attention to. 
And we can tiss, 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 and we can shake our fingers, but that's an audience that we're not just losing as consumers of our publications, but we're losing as part of a civic dialogue. Now, there's a lot of people in the audience at this point who are ready to ask me the question, is this advocacy journalism? And the good news about this format is that you don't get to ask me questions. <laughs> so I'm going to stand up and answer the question for you anyway and say, hell yes, this is advocacy journalism. And we're doing advocacy journalism all the time when we make a news value judgment. When we put Malawi on the front page, when we finally report a story from Mattapan, that is advocacy journalism. When Laura and Chris Amico show up and say, Homicide Watch DC means we're going to pay attention to everybody who gets killed in that city, whether they're black or white, whether they're rich or poor, that is advocacy journalism. The problem is not advocacy journalism. The problem is bad sorts of advocacy for bad civics. When we stand up and advocate vote for that guy or vote for that guy, that's not helpful. When we advocate in a way that says, we're going to explain a complicated, difficult issue, we're going to help figure out how you as a citizen can have an impact, we're going to help you figure out how the world works so you can be part of it, that's what we need to do if we're going to take really seriously not just the survival of this industry, but the public service mission. Now, my goal in all of this, every time I stand up in front of a group, it's not so much to persuade, it's to provoke. I hope if I haven't done the former, I've at least done the latter. Please keep sending me Neemans. At the BBC, we say, follow that. Um, <laughs> We heard a lot last night in those wonderful acts of storytelling about the need as journalists to get the details right, get the facts right on a story, and that, that's absolutely right. There's another big responsibility we all have, and that's about understanding the context of the facts that we're reporting. And I feel that especially as, as, a, as a foreign journalist with the BBC for many years. If I think of some of the places I've worked over the years, even reporting a simple act like the security forces arresting someone. The context could be very different if that's in West Berlin or East Berlin, in West, Berlin, in West Jerusalem or East Jerusalem, even on my last posting in Northwest Washington, D.C. or Southeast Washington, D.C. So it's one of the reasons I'm particularly looking forward to um, our next speaker this evening. Uh, Professor Sheila Jasanoff um, has spent much of her career studying exactly this kind of context, but in her own specialist field of science and technology studies. Uh, she's produced a wealth of pioneering research about the role of science and technology in modern democracies around the globe, many of which, like a good academic, a good scientist, uh, even a good reporter, she has visited, lived in, and written about at length. Now, I know that many Neemans, I know that there's even at least one of them here today have uh, taken Sheila's classes over the years and have said they are amongst the most influ influential that they uh, spent time with. Um, I'm also reliably informed that if you are left intellectually dissatisfied at the end of this wonderful morning, that I know Sheila will be happy to talk you through another of her specialist subjects, the structure of medieval Bengali languages. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker, Professor Sheila Jasanov. Thank you, Simon, for that introduction. And it's a real rare treat to be with all of you uh, here this morning. It actually is morning, Simon, and not evening. Uh, <laughs> I know in a room like this, it's hard to keep track. Uh, but my own first introduction to the Neiman Fellowship Program was when I took First Amendment Law with Tony Lewis. And so uh, it's been a part of my life, and I read the work that all of you produce on a, well, at least a sample of it, on a semi-regular basis. And, um, of course, it's also a special treat to hear from our colleagues this morning, whom we don't hear enough of um, from being in our cloistered places at Harvard. So uh, one of the uh, 
one of the thoughts I had was that I'm going to be talking about innovation because it's a buzzword in science and technology these days. Wherever one goes, one hears about innovation. And in fact, I was interested to see that on your program later tomorrow or later today, you have innovations in storytelling, whereas I'm going to be talking about storytelling about innovation. So without knowing that I was going to reverse the real, I already had it all planned out. And I'm going to reverse the real in another way that also was unplanned because I'm going to suggest that innovation, in a way, reverses the kind of proce process that Jill Lepore was talking about earlier this morning. Jill mentioned going from mystery to uh, secrecy to privacy, but what was elided there was that between the secrecy and the privacy, there was publicness and then came the privacy. So I'm going to suggest that innovation in the way that it's usually talked about by some of you in this room uh, goes from things that are actually public and lying around ready to hand, making them secret, and eventually making them mysterious. So it's a process of turning the, the wheel of science backward in a sense and taking some things that could have been easily in the public domain but making them as if mysterious. And this is something that I think we ought to resist in the name of the kind of citizenship that Ethan was talking about a moment ago. So let me talk about some of these back stories. We think about creativity, we think about moments of innovation as being flashes, flashes of genius, bursts of creation. And here's one such story. It is the report in Nature magazine in 1997 of the birth of the sheep Dolly. Um, and the image is interesting because it suggests, you know, this thing stepping out of a petri dish, life created out of scientific instruments. But if you're into images, as I'm sure many of you are, you may think of some of the other connotations here, why the circular image connoting a planetary backdrop, why the particular stepping out of Dolly's legs from out of the circle, I'm reminded of that image of William Blake uh, showing God creating the earth. And, and it's, uh, uh, there's somehow latent in the imagery itself a notion that this is a first moment. There was nothing behind it. It burst forth as if out of nowhere. So if you think about context, as Simon suggested correctly, I do, you know that that's made up, that behind every innovation is a genealogy, a history, waiting to be excavated. And that genealogy, in the case of the birth of Dolly the sheep, includes fiction. It includes one of the very first stories about human beings creating novel forms of life. It includes stories about industrialization of those processes of creating novel forms of life. And we're all familiar with Brave New World. Also, many of us are familiar with the human reproductive techniques that to some extent predated the cloning of Dolly the sheep. But one reason all of us immediately became so concerned about the ethical implications of Dolly was that we already were primed to think about ethical issues when reproduction had been taken out of the womb and into the test tube 20 years before the birth of Dolly. There was a very influential ethics report that to this day lays down the foundations for the ways in which we think about how to deal with innovation in the realm of uh, reproductive technologies. And in Britain, but not in America, an entire new regulatory structure was developed that predated by a number of years the birth of Dolly. And interestingly, even the birth of Dolly was in a sense not the birth of Dolly because it was reported a full seven months later, an odd way to celebrate a novel birth. And it illustrates, I think, in micro form, the ways in which behind the alleged innovation is an entire history 
of obfuscation and secrecy making, if you will, so that the moment of innovation becomes a kind of mystery to us instead of seeming like a progression that was caused by human beings through human institutions and through kinds of work being done that bring particular modes of innovation to light. So it's not only the historical progression that brings us to that burst of crea creativity that we tend to forget, but we also make up the needs that innovation is supposed to serve. And I was interested to find in the New York Times this past summer, just a month or so ago, a new burst of writing about a product of genetic engineering in the agricultural domain that's been with us as a story for a very long time. So I think it was more than 10 years ago that Time magazine had this cover story, this rice could save a million kids a year, and then fast forward or not so fast forward 10 or 11 years, and we get golden rice, a lifesaver or lifesaver. Um, and so what's, what's going on here? I mean, first of all, if it's an innovation, then we shouldn't actually be coming back to whether or not it's a lifesaver and how many millions we're saving sort of decades apart. But to me, there's something else going on here. So whose lives are we saving and where do we get the million figure from? We have to create the million. In a sense, the innovators depend on a prior creation of a world of millions of people who are dependent on that particular innovation in order to be suckered then by the findings of science. So back in the in 1992 or in the 1990s, I came across this rather extraordinary image of an entire continent at need of being rescued by science and technology. And it was actually called, this cartoon was called Africa Begging. And this is why, Ethan, I'm a little bit suspicious to some extent about the ways in which global news is delivered because it does matter. The format matters and how one casts the rest of the world matters as well. But it's not just public and popular journalism. That is, one can dismiss this image as, well, it couldn't happen in America. We wouldn't be telling this particular story or, or whatever. But I was interested to find in Science Magazine not so long ago, ten, again, about 10 years ago, a rather strange article. So this was by the then director of the Rockefeller Foundation, which has been an enormous supporter of the development of agricultural biotechnology. And the story was about why agricultural bio biotechnology is profoundly needed in Africa. But this is Science Magazine, leading science journal, one of two, along with Nature, in the entire universe, as far as we know. And it is about a fictional character. So you don't think of Science Magazine as a place where fictions are being created, but Conway and Tunison actually write, we will refer to Mrs. We will refer to Mrs. Namoronda, the quotations are theirs, who represents a composite of situations existing in Africa. And then the whole purpose of the technology is to serve this composite person. The language in which this composite lady is then talked about reminds us of the plagues of Egypt. Because Mrs. Namurunda, we find, had a cassava crop that was de devastated by cassava mealybugs. Her banana seedlings were infected with weevils. Her beans suffered from fungal diseases that shriveled pods. And more often than not, she faced a drought during the growing season. So all of these problems are there to be solved through the development of agricultural biotechnology, which, however, takes a very long time to germinate, as we see from the story of golden rice, which is an ongoing story, not at an end yet. And so one of the things that we should keep in mind is that in order to produce innovation, we have to create the somehow the group of people who are going to be benefited, and the characterizations of those people are not always the ones that lead to the greatest civic involvement by the very people whose problems innovation is intended to serve. So contrast something else. Contrast 
innovators who are rarely put on the same page as innovators in science and technology. And yet, arguably, these innovators have had at least as much impact on the lives of people in the modern world, in the contemporary world, as the ones who are innovating in science and technology. So I want to suggest, and I want to leave with this thought, that, and this, I think, echoes a message that you just heard from Ethan about journalism in general, that there is a mode of innovation that begins with the people being served by the innovation. And unlike that image of Africa, this other mode of innovation begins with an assumption not of neediness, not of distress, not of poverty, not of hunger, not of begging, but of competence. So what did these innovators, whose images I showed you in the previous slide, and some others that I will throw in for fun, assume about competence? Gandhi built a, an entire movement on the basis that individuals in a still colonial country were capable of political competence. Martin Luther King built a movement on the basis that people who had been denied the vote in many cases were capable of civic competence. Mohammed Yunus built an entire new approach to finance and banking on the theory that very ordinary people are capable at a micro scale of economic competence. J.K. Rowling has assumed that children are capable of imaginative competence. Tim Berners-Lee assumed a world in which people will share information and have a kind of competence to do that. And Mark Zuckerberg left Harvard because he believed that networking competence that he would build in other ways would give him a better education <laughs> than all of us are capable of providing. <laughs> so, so I think innovation needs to be celebrated in all of its forms. And I think the stories we need to tell about innovation have to be more complex more critical, and above all, more comprehending. Thank you. I start again? <gasps> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I work for the radio, I'm sorry. I have a strong voice. So the thing is that I will use my mobile, that I am not tweeting. I'm not using Facebook. I'm using my mobile for something really important to me at this moment. And I think well, that's one of the first lessons that I learned from Nico Mele, which is that the way we use is it's not that easy to figure out the way we are using technology and the way people are using technology. And it can be mislead us. So the first time I heard Professor Nicomele speak, I was at the Niemann Foundation. It was last year, and I was so proud of having been chosen as the Niemann. And I was starting to think that maybe we should be more optimistic about the future of journalism and journalism in general. But then Nico spoke, and he hit me with his views about how hard it is and it will be to retain the public conversation that we call journalism and for today and in the next decades. And I felt challenged. And I have to admit it, I felt a little bit upset because I was living my dream year and he was telling me that the storm was coming. I didn't want to listen to that. But after taking his class and after different conversations with Nico Mel in Cambridge, in London for unknown reasons, and in Santiago de Chile, where he went, I realized that that's what Professor Mele is best at, challenging us, forcing us to realize that if we want to be relevant for our readers or our audience, we have to start to prepare today, right now, for that present and for that future. Nico Mele is an adjunct lecturer in public policy and a leading expert in the integration of social media and everything digital with politics and business and communications. And he's also the author of The End of Big, which is a book about how some of our big institutions, journalism included, are mutating into a smaller, uh, more flexible spaces, sometimes for better 
and sometimes for wars. It's a book, it's a book about being big and small, about being feeble and powerful. And I think The End of Big is a proper name for a book written by someone like Nico Melle, who knows how to make you feel humble about everything you don't know, but so big and powerful about all the things you can still learn. My professor, Nico Melle. Thank you. Like Ethan, I find this a bit of a terrifying arrangement, <laughs> in part because I'm following some exceptional people who have been real inspirations to me in my life. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's just a, it's a little terrifying. Although I was thrilled to learn I am not the most tattooed Harvard professor, which <laughs> for a long time I thought might be true. I think the world changed in 1984. The good nerds among you will remember that was when Steve Jobs introduced the first Macintosh personal computer. But that's not what I'm talking about. In 1984, a guy named Chuck Hull invented something called stereolithography. Today we call that 3D printing. That's a 3D printer. It sprays plastic into shapes. I have one. I bought one about a year ago. Yesterday I took a group of recent Neiman Fellows who I had lunch with to my office to see it. I have two little boys, almost five and almost three, and on the first warm spring day last April, I wanted them to wear uh, sandals outside. But they'd grown a lot since the last summer, and I didn't really want to put them in the car to take them to, mall, to the mall to buy new shoes. So I printed them sandals. And a couple weekends ago, we were at a friend's house, and she had these new shoes, heels she'd bought, and my wife says, oh, I love those. And so I said, oh, could I borrow them overnight? And I took them. I took them and I scanned them with a 3D scanner, and then I printed a copy. Although my wife was not too keen on wearing them in yellow plastic. <laughs> and this sounds awesome. This is what I love about technology, all of the opportunities this opens up. There's an engineer in Italy who's built a 3D printer that prints large, uh, that it's almost buildings that they're trying to figure out if they can use to print latrines. There's all kinds of opportunity being opened up by this. But a couple days after I printed the sandals for my boys, a guy in Texas uh, uploaded the blueprints to print the essential pieces of an AR-15 assault rifle, and then printed them and shot them on camera for some journalists to prove that this would work. And this is the essential promise and peril of our technology. Jill opened with that ad, right? The, 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 the right of unlimited. And that sounds like a joke, but I believe that's actually at the heart of our technology. That's an essential value our technology carries. It's the technology to make the individual powerful beyond, beyond comprehension. And the thesis of my book, my argument, is that our technology is pushing power to individuals at an enormous, intense rate, an incredible diffusion of power that all of our big institutions are not really prepared to manage. Big news, big political parties, big, go oh, big government, big militaries, even big fun, movies, music, publishing, big companies, big manufacturing, the commoditization of scale. It's not any good to be big anymore because someone smaller will compete, has the power in almost any industry, in almost any institution. I go to meetings all the time in Washington, D.C., 
and, 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 and in corporate boardrooms, and even, I dare say, the occasional Harvard faculty meeting. And I, I sit in these meetings, and I think, this is not a world I know. You, you people making these decisions, I don't live in the same world as you. I come out of computer programming. All of my significant mentors were either computer programmers or political operatives. And I just don't recognize some of it. And uh, I was reading uh, Barbara Tuckman's The Guns of August. And she's talking about King Edward VII's funeral in 1910. And how in 1910, it is the most opulent thing imaginable. You would look at it and think the monarchy was going to live forever. A hundred nations send their representatives, all of them colonies or monarchies, except for the United States, Switzerland, and France in 1910. And then I re read King Kaiser and Tsar about the letters they were writing, the cousins were writing back and forth to each other. And they're writing, they're writing in, tw in 1910, they're saying, in 2013, when our grandchildren are the monarchs of Europe and the colonies. You know, it's 1910, and like Lenin is on the streets shouting, right? And that's basically how I feel all the time. <laughs> and where we ended up, this was not an accident. The power, the unlimited power for the individual, that was not an accident. Does anyone want to guess the year of the first computer science program in the United States? 1962. Anyone want to guess where? Purdue University, 1962. That means that if you're a computer scientist growing up in the 60s, you're growing up on college campuses in the middle of the civil rights movement and the uh, the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. Here you are building computers for the Pentagon to use, right? And a generation of computer scientists rejected that. They, they, they didn't want that. And so they designed technology to push power to individuals. This is a Cray supercomputer circa 1975. In 1975, it cost five million bucks, base price, and was only available to the world's largest institutions, big governments, big universities, big corporations. And today, your smartphone is actually a lot more powerful than this Cray supercomputer. And you can walk into any strip mall in America and buy one of these. And I, I just read Turing's Cathedral about the relationship between the development of the uh, nuclear bomb and the development of the computer. And I thought, wow, imagine if you could walk into any strip mall in America and buy a nuclear bomb. And that's kind of how I think of this. And so here are all these computer scientists growing up on college campuses in the 60s. And uh, you know, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, they met just days after the Kent State shooting. This is the cultural environment they're growing up in. And there's this guy, Ted Nelson, writes this book in 1974. You can and must understand computers now. Computer lib. And this book says we must claim computers away from the institutions and push them to people because it's the only way we will hold that power accountable. Bill Gates, with his first gazillion dollars, bites, buys the rights to this book and republishes it in 1984. If you've read Walter Isaacson's biography, Steve Jobs talks about the, the, the power and the influence of thinkers like this. This was the culture that the nerds came out of. The 1984 television ad that introduced the Macintosh during the Super Bowl was one about, you know, sticking it to the man. And so then we have this incredible pace of our technology. In, from the mid-70s to the mid-80s, we go from computers that fill a room to sitting on every desktop in America. Then we start connecting them to each other to share the proverbial H drive and the printer. And then we start connecting them all to everybody else. And now we have the internet. And now we walk around with these things, right? And that is, that's tremendous power for individuals 
that disrupts our institutions, our institutions built on hierarchy and process. So this guy, Sebastian Thrun. Sebastian Thrun, tenured professor at Stanford, very prominent, leaves Stanford to teach online through Udacity, saying, I'd rather teach 150,000 students than 150. And I thought, and he doesn't have to go to faculty meetings. <laughs> Georgia Tech, Georgia Tech now offers a $7,000 engineering master's degree available only online. Now, I think that part of the story here is not just about the push of power from institutions to individuals. It's also about the way our institutions have failed. The cost of a four-year degree in the United States has skyrocketed. Its economic value has plummeted. The Department of Labor says that 19% of parking attendants have finished a four-year degree and have all the corresponding debt. In many ways, higher education has fundamentally failed in the United States. And yet, it's an important vehicle for basic research, for credentialing, for peer review, for scientific process, for all kinds of essential stuff. And so I struggle because I don't really want to defend the institution of higher education, but I also feel like it has these core essential values that are fundamental to who we are and to being a, a healthy democracy. Then we talk about politics, right? I think that the story of Obama beating Hillary in 08, an unthinkable political act for an insurgent to beat an establishment politician like Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton has spent her entire life in the Democratic Party for running for president. Obama had been in public life less than 10 years. Hillary knew the name of every major donor in the Democratic Party, which was, in fact, part of the problem. And Obama was new. And yet Obama manages to defeat Hillary because the power existed outside the party. The parties had failed. They'd become vehicles for major donor fundraising. And if you could build an alternative way of raising money through the internet, you could defeat it. Unless you think that that was just a democratic story, that's what's happened in the Republican Party. Part of why we're in our current predicament, a guy like Ted Cruz does not need the establishment Republican Party. The, the institution has failed, and the breakdown of accountability is intense. We had 12 Senate races the last two cycles where the Republican establishment candidate lost to the Tea Party insurgent. And now we talk about journalism, right? The institutions of journalism, they don't seem to be able or ready to account for the individual power. I think it changes the production of news. And I think, again, of recent Neiman Fellow, Laura Amico and Chris Amico, and their uh, Homicide Watch DC about trying to empower the community to help produce the news, the changing the way we produce the news, changing the way we distribute the news. I, I did this for the current Neiman class the other day, right? I think about some of the big moments in American history. The shooting of JFK. Everybody remembers Walter Cronkite taking off his glasses, crying. We think about, I say Watergate, everybody in this room thinks about the Washington Post. I say uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and you have these images from CNN, right, of the wall coming down. I say 9-11, and I always think of Rudy Giuliani doing press conferences to communicate what's going on. The death of Osama bin Laden, Keith Urban, up here, he tweets, I have just heard from a reliable source they've killed Osama bin Laden, hot damn. He didn't have that many Twitter followers, but he was a senior member of Donald Rumfeld's staff uh, when Donald Rumsfeld was Secretary of Defense. And down here is a reporter for the New York Times, Brian Stelter, who retweets it, and it goes viral. The distribution of that news was all from individuals on Twitter and Facebook. And in fact, the first time the, first, the person really, the journalist to break that news was a New York Times reporter, and national security was not his beat, and he wasn't in Washington, D.C., and it was via Twitter. And then finally, we talk about business models, right, for journalism. 
Here is Nate Silver, and I'm sure some people will argue with me whether or not he's actually a journalist, right? He's driving 20% of the New York Times traffic to their website right before the election, the day before the election. But he has to choose, because he has a brand new book out, and he has to choose every day, does he sell his book, or does he help the New York Times get more people to visit their website? A kind of lunatic institutional organization where the talent is not aligned to help the institution make money. And so, broadly speaking, when I think about, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a computer programmer and a political hack, a political operative, and the uh, journalism was not something I was too fond of in either role. And the great lesson to me of the Neiman Fellows has been the essential nature of the core values of journalism in our society. But when I look at many of the institutions that carry those core values for journalism, I'm, I'm not inclined to defend them. Business models built on 80% advertising make absolutely zero sense to me from my nerd vantage point. And so my hope and prayer, my excitement for talking to all of the Neiman Fellows comes down to building the future of journalism, building new institutions, new vehicles to carry these core values of journalism that take advantage of the digital world, that take advantage of the enormous power that individuals carry and assume that there will, I assume there will be no more big. Except asterisks. There are seven companies that essentially control your online life. Amazon, Apple, eBay, Facebook, Google, Skype, and Twitter. And just like newspapers needed to learn over 50 to 75 years, like the core values of sourcing and their sense of public responsibility, I too think that these, these big institutions, these big, the new big, they have to learn their own role in mediating the public space. And we need to demand accountability from them. I was sitting in my office directly across the hall the day of the Boston bombing. And I had to get evacuated from my office because there was a bomb threat in Harvard Square. And it turns out there wasn't a bomb threat. It was a rumor on Twitter. And it is absolutely incomprehensible to me why Twitter did not say, here are three feeds you should follow for accurate news about the Boston bombing. The, Bo the Boston police Twitter feed, the FBI Twitter feed, and maybe, I dare say, the Boston Globe Twitter feed, right? <laughs> there are opportunities here that we must take advantage of. And I am delighted to speak to all of you and yield the balance of my time <laughs> to whoever's next. <laughs> I am honored and humbled to introduce our final speaker of this wonderful morning, business historian Nancy Kane. As one of Harvard's big biggest thinkers, at least metaphorically, Ms. Kane has shared many of her biggest thoughts and ideas for the millions of listeners on public radio. Just this week on Marketplace, <laughs> Kane told us that there are 11 million formal business meetings every day in America. Think about that. 11 million meetings every day, not including this one. And that's about a third of NPR's weekly audience. She says those 11 million daily meetings work out to about 4 billion meetings a year. And Kane says half of the people in those meetings say they find them unproductive. So that's two billion unproductive meetings per year. <laughs> think about the time and money wasted. And think about how blessed we are as Neemans that for an entire academic year, we all found all of our meetings exceptionally productive, <laughs> especially our soundings. How many unproductive meetings, though, have we sat in during our careers? Note to the Neiman class of 2014, those meetings await you when you return to your jobs next summer. <laughs> Good luck with that. Ms. Kane pens a wonderful blog with advice 
not just for business folks, but journalists as well. For example, she asks us, she wisely advises us to stop sleeping with our smartphones. She doesn't want us to turn them off entirely. Even she admits she'd be a basket case if she lost her iPhone. But she says, consider turning off the iPhone or Android an hour before going to bed. And during that hour, quote, read a book, hug a partner or a pet, even watch a movie, and then see what happens to your sleep and your energy the following day. And she warns, avoid fiddling with your iPhones during meetings, even if the meeting is unproductive. So please join me in welcoming the James E. Robinson Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School. I'm not, hang on. <laughs> Coach and mentor to hundreds of top business executives every year. No, it's fine, you can come, it's fine. And, and author of the story of American business, Nancy Kay. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. It's really a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here. I've known many of you through the years. I've taught all kinds of things since I've been at Harvard for many, many years. I'm aging as we speak. Um, I now teach a big course on the history of leadership. Um, it's called Power and Glory in Turbulent Times, the history of leadership from Henry IV to Steve Jobs. And that means we have a lot of Neiman fellows in that class every year. It also means we don't have a lot of guests because until the very last part of the class, they're all dead. <laughs> now I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna end this embarrassment of Rich's morning. What a fantastic, just a fantastic set of presentations. Bless you to my colleagues, every single one. I'm actually gonna end, that, end this morning with a very, very different, sm very small story about a woman who didn't want publicity, wasn't concerned about the relationship between mystery, secrecy, and privacy, who believed very, very strongly in the integrity and the lessons and the tenderness and the beauty and the vital importance of the biological, natural world that is our world, a woman who assumed extraordinary moral competence. That was an astounding slide, Sheila. Extraordinary moral competence on the part of her readers who lived Ben Franklin's adage, not Jane, his sister, but Ben Franklin's adage, the pen is mightier than the sword, who ended up, you know, this is in the 1960s, Supreme Court Justice William Douglas compared her, um, Nico and Ethan, to uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, as you'll remember Lincoln once said to Harriet Beecher Stowe when he met her, so you're the little woman, she was very short, who started this great big war. She was also a little woman who started, who took the world by storm, but not because she was seeking publicity, and not because she had a lot of handlers, and not because she, she walked the corridors of power. She did none and wanted none of those things. And we know very little about her today, and the generations older than I am, the last boomer, know nothing of her. And yet her story, which is part of a book I'm writing, on, it's called Forged in Crisis. It's about five individuals, each of whom found themselves in an extraordinary moment of personal turbulence. And who, through navigating that turbulence, their own crises, ended up, in some cases, like Lincoln, seeking it, but most of the time not seeking what they ended up with. When God wants to punish you, he surely answers your prayers. Ended up having an extraordinary impact. And, and Rachel Carson is one of those people. So I want to talk very briefly about her experience writing Silent Spring. Remember that title, published in 1962, 51 years ago, was chosen. Actually, it was an idea of her, of her publishers, but she thought of the reason why it was so great, Paul. Um, Brooks at Houghton Mifflin, she said this silent spring is the spring in the future when there is no bird song because of what we have done to the environment. Um, so let me say just a word about her and then I want to talk to you very, very briefly, 10 minutes here because we're over time as it is, about, about her experience writing that book. So this is just a picture of her, um, a, a famous picture. She was uh, born to hard scrabble, what we call hard scrabble parents outside of Pittsburgh, for, struggled all her life to support her family economically, her birth family, she never married, her birth family, uh, and then her sisters, her mother all her life, her mother lived to within two years of Rachel Carson's life, 
her niece, nieces, her sisters, her grandnephew. She adopted her grandnephew at the age of 50 uh, in 1957, and therefore he was five at the time, and therefore became literally right a stay-at-home and working mom. All moms are working, right? And yes, for mothers, and and and, and always had an extraordinary, if you will barge to, to drive, uh, bail to tote of domestic responsibilities. She was a biologist before women were biologists. She had a master's degree in that from Johns Hopkins before women had the audacity to do anything like that. And she was also a poet. So in our world where we, you know, have, you know, we live in this apotheosis of technology, she was a scientist who also understood the beauty and grace and elegance of accessible language. And she lived in both those worlds and ultimately integrated them very successfully. Most of her working life, she was a, and she lived, like you, Katie, oh, your presentation, she lived with one foot in her study, one foot for a long time paying her bills, right, getting, earning her W-2, click, 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 those high heels and stockings, walking the halls, of Washington bureaucracy. She lived as a biologist and an editor for what was then the Fishery and Wildlife Service of the United States. She also lived, had one foot always in the field. So this wonderful combination that is part of her whole life as a biologist studying the natural world, as an editor and writer for the Fish and Wildlife Service, and also as a writer on the side because she had books going. And she wrote, like so many of us in this room, between the cracks and crevices of a very, very business lo busy life, full, as every woman in this life, in this room knows so well, of caretaking, right? The demands, the blessings, the curses, the exhaustion of ongoing caretaking. And so she, she for, for most of her 20s and 30s, and into her 40s, she's working for the Fish and Wildlife Service and writing for magazines and books on the side. And in 1951, her second book, some of us will remember this book, I remember it on the shelf growing up, The Sea Around Us became a bestseller and enabled her to stop working for a W-2 and start writing full time. And she did that. And then, just a couple of shots of her in the lab and in the field, and then in the 19, late 1950s, through a set of circumstances we needn't double click on here, she comes, becomes very interested in something that we don't even think about today in the same way, but was very important at the time, synthetic pesticides, heptachlor, DDT. We don't even think about these things in the same way that, the, that we did then, although we're living, Ethan and Nico are fabulous examples of this, right, with their very critical and careful uh, and serious eye on it. We're living in an age that, that, that worships at the altar of scientific progress, techno we call it technological progress today, in the same way that we were worshiping at the altar of literally chemical progress in the late 1950s and 1960s. And she didn't intend to do this, but ended up taking that on. So DDT, right? I, I, I've known people, I, I, this was not my experience, but I've known people who literally grew up playing in the clouds of mass spraying of DDT, heptachlor, other, other technologies. This is from a chemical company's ad. DDT is good for me. So she starts getting very interested in these pesticides and in anecdote, initially anecdotal reports of wildlife, human life, natural, uh, biological and plant life suffering with mass sprayings. And beginning in 1957, she makes a decision to write a book about this. And man, oh man, folks, in an age when we're cutting and pasting from Wikipedia, this woman is doing her homework. She's not doing it with lots of research assistants. She's not doing it with speech writers. She's doing it in her home outside of Washington, D.C., caring for her mother, caring for this, this new child in her life, caring for her niece, working hard, working smart, working through frustration and exhaustion and all kinds of obstacles. And she's beginning detective work is what all good reporting and historical and biological research is all about. She's beginning to put together a puzzle. And she, and she gets a publishing contract for what will become Silent Spring in 1956, 1957 and begins working. And then it's a whole series of extraordinary obstacles. Initially, it's all kinds of health problems, pneumonia, arthritis, an eye infection. Eventually, she won't be able to see through lots of Silent Spring, and people will have to read her the pages of the manuscript, and she'll have to dictate parts of it. But then, in 1960, 
it's, it's, it's the removal of some lumps from her breast. Then get this, doctors, because you're not, that you're not, it's not protocol to tell an unmarried woman, you would tell her husband first what her diagnosis was if she was married, to tell her what's wrong with her. Doctors at the time say she has a lump that they don't think is cancerous, but they've done a radical mastectomy. And she plows on ahead through this. She's very, very ill. She plows on ahead through this. And then in November, she's working furiously, working in libraries, working on the telephone with other scientists reaching out, working through her f set of connections. She has no contacts on her smartphone. Her Rolodex, her cards of people that she knows through the Fish and Wildlife Service, putting this picture together. And then in, 19, in late 1960, she knows another lump under, in the same place. And she has, it turns out she goes to Cleveland Clinic, she has metastasizing breast cancer, and she knows she won't live very long. So the last two years of Silent Spring are literally her efforts to outrun the disease and publish the book because she knows by 1961 she has the story. She knows what these chemicals do. She knows what their danger is. She's established with, again, she fact checks everything, right? Again, not, she doesn't have a computer to do that, but literally with experts, her papers are full of all these letters she types out on her Smith Corona and then receives back letters by post. Remember when we used to get real mail? Right? Receives letters back from experts in the field. So she knows she's laid an integrated, accessible. There, it's poetry. Parts of this book are poetry. If you haven't reread it, it is an easy and jaw dropping read. She knows she has it, but literally she can't believe that these, these, these things keep coming her way. Well, by 1961, the chemical industry has a whiff of what she's doing, and now it's lawyers, and it's threats, and it's all kinds of other obstacles in her path, and she is still dealing with chemotherapy and ra well, excuse me, radiation and extraordinary debilitations health-wise while she manages to run her household. So just to fast forward, she finishes the book late, there's a wonderful moment when she writes a friend. She said, "You know, I am. There are so many. There are so many roadblocks in my path. If, if I was, if I was a, a, a superstitious person, I would think there are larger forces that don't want me to publish the book." And, and William Shawn gets hold of an early version of the manuscript from the New Yorker and serializes it beginning in June of 1962. And Silent Spring, as a headline ran in the New York Times, becomes a very, very hot summer, very hot and noisy summer. And and and. The pen is mightier than the sword. Beginning with, with the serialization and then with the publication, if you look at what's happening at the public policy, the public policy kind of level and at milestones, it's a series of extraordinary, extraordinary movement. From President Kennedy, John Kennedy mentioning in a press conference to uh, Stuart Udall, the Secretary of the Interior, picking up the ball and carrying it to a, a, a whole series of things that will become, by 1964, the kindling that lights the fire of the modern environmental movement. And this little lady, this very calm, soft-spoken, careful, studious, graceful woman, has unleashed an extraordinary movement. And here she is, this, she, was, uh, she, she, she was dying by 19, late 1963, and so she's very carefully husbanding her energy. That very, very few big major public achievements, although she's become famous almost against her will. She, she does a 60 Minutes interview with Eric Severide and, 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 and introduces the world to what she's talking about. And if you, ha you, can, go you can YouTube it. It's an, uh, and there's a scientist from Dow speaking who's utterly unconvincing. And she's very, very quiet, and, and, he's, and very, very, um, very, very persuasive. Um, and then here she is testifying. She testifies at several congressional committees. Um, and then here she is. This was actually taken a couple of years before the book, book was published in, in, a, in a park outside her home. Um, we're out of time. Let me summarize with just a couple of things we need to learn right now in our own turbulent, terribly, terribly narcissistic and at the same time, sonambulant moment, we're asleep, many of us, right? We're asleep while these large tectonic plates of which each of our speakers has spoken, right? Uh, the, the quest, the incongruous quest for fame, I call it fame, right? Married to this, you know, obsession with privacy, inner city neighborhoods, right? Rome is burning in the inner city neighborhoods. Um, 
we don't understand some of the very, very basic building blocks of this extraordinarily synthetic, extraordinarily intelligent, ex all uh, virtually divine endowment to us called the world's environment, Mother Nature's gift to us. This is, what, this is exactly what Rachel Carson was talking about, to what's happening right, in technology and what it means for us. So just a couple of things to think about. In turbulent times, here was someone who said, I'm going to do this once I understand what the story is and what it means, not, not for policy making, not for my own reputation, not for some kind of headlines that I may get, garner, but for goodness. Each of the people I'm interested in were interested, by virtue of their personal crisis, found themselves up against a wall and committed as a result of their, own, of their own extraordinary adversity to goodness. So once we commit to goodness, we've got to figure out lots of flexible ways, as she did, to finish this book in order to achieve it. The willingness to step back, I worry about this a lot with you folks in the room, you, who, you the fourth estate, you have more power than just about any other single group of people in our global village. I worry whether we have enough solitude and enough detachment on a regular basis to understand what's really happening at the large arc level. The ability that she had that was so astounding to stay focused as the world crashed in <coughs> at her door and over her. The importance of old fashioned homework. Finding the space, for her it was early in the morning and late at night to do your best, your best work, and then the extraordinary importance of never giving up. I want to leave you with two different quotes from her. They are both from si early in Silent Spring. This is for, this is for your, this group. I, didn't, I haven't read this to, I don't read this to the different business leaders in the same way that I work with. Knowing what I do, I would have no peace. She wrote this to a friend in the midst of all these legal threats. By the way, no suits for libel were ever brought successfully against Silent Spring. Knowing what I do, I could have no peace for me. There would be no peace for me if I kept silent. And then last, and most important for our moment, right here, right now. Let us not fall into a mesmerized state that makes us accept as inevitable that which is inferior or detrimental as though we have lost the will to demand what is good. Demand goodness, commit to goodness. Her life was about the small and the real and how the hell it matters to us today at the beginning of another very turbulent moment. What a truly amazing and inspiring morning this has been. Um, you have filled us with story ideas. You have gotten us to think about journalism and our new newsrooms in new ways and ways we can and should do our work better. And if, I think it's a real reminder for all of us about the cross-pollinization that can and should exist between academia and journalism and how much we can benefit from each other. So can we all, can the speakers all stand up so we can say a collective thank you to all of you.